evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the first lecture at UTC, sponsored by the Christian Study Center of Chattanooga. Uh, I'm David Beckman, the director. The Christian Study Center of Chattanooga is a new independent educational institution that seeks to engage in a shared exploration of knowledge and understanding with the local university for the common good of our community. We believe that the Christian faith with its Judaic and classical roots contributes a vibrant and beneficial perspective to every field of study as it has proven so to do in the past. Our lecture tonight is especially aimed at you English majors or minors as the case may be. We'll be learning about a connection between English uh, romance authors and the famous autobiography Surprised by Joy written by an English tutor at Oxford University Mr. Clive Stapleton Lewis. And introducing our lecturer tonight is Dr. Brian Hampton, professor of English here at UTC, for y'all, those of y'all who have not met him, and a member of our board of directors. Dr. Hampton, thank you. Uh, thank you, David, and welcome to everybody, including students who are here under duress. Um, I'm uh, honored to introduce uh, Dr. Heather Hess, a uh, former student of mine when she was in the graduate program here. Um, she currently teaches um, literature and composition at Covenant College, and she's a graduate of Covenant College as an undergrad, uh, the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga for her MA program, and UTK for her PhD program. She specializes in 19th century British literature, um, and uh, in particular, her most recent project focus on the conceptions of 19th century child, or children, uh, and the influence of romantic and neo-Victorian meta-narrative, and she can tell you what that is, if you don't think she would, uh, in works of 20th and 21st century fantasy. She's a member of North, uh, North Shore Fellowship and lives in Chattanooga with her husband, David, and two children, Jane and Owen. Her lecture tonight engages C.S. Lewis's autobiography, and the lecture is titled Surprised by Joy as Romantic Narrative. Uh, following the lecture, I hope to have a short period of question and answer, um, if that's okay with you. And, uh, and I'll help her field some of the questions. So, thanks. It's a delight to be here. Um, I am particularly excited to do anything to support the Christian Study Center because I personally am very passionate about faith integration and learning. And part of the reason I thought it was appropriate to talk about C.S. Lewis tonight is because I think that he's someone that actually does that very well. Um, Lewis had an incredible ability to <coughs> find God's truth in a variety of places. And hopefully it will be clear through what I'm about to share with you how he, um, how I really think God actually revealed himself to Lewis through the work of the Romantics. So let's get going. <clears throat> Lewis's meta narrative, surprised by joy as romantic autobiography. If I am a romantic, my parents bear no responsibility for it says C.S. Lewis at the beginning of Surprised by Joy. He goes on to explain that there was no copy either of Keats or Shelley in the house, and the copy of Coleridge was never opened. Yet these were the kind of literature to which my allegiance was given the moment I could choose books for myself. That Lewis was indeed a romantic has never really been a subject for debate. Surprised by Joy, the autobiographical story of Lewis's journey to faith, was published in 1955 and reviewers were immediately calling it the conversion of a pure romantic. So I don't intend to spend my time tonight convincing you that he was romantic. We're going to take his word for it. But I should perhaps pause here to provide a brief definition of romanticism, if this will work, which it isn't. Okay. If you showed up tonight hoping to hear a love story, I'm afraid I've lured you here under false pretenses. The romanticism to which I refer, and to which Lewis is deeply indebted, 
for the late 18th, early 19th century literary movement. Romanticism responded to, the, to Enlightenment rationalism by instead emphasizing human emotion, individual experience, and artistic genius. It celebrated the beauty, vitality, and sublimity of nature and of the human imagination. Romanticism also, and this is perhaps the most important bit for our purposes tonight, can be credited with the invention of childhood as we know it today. Our popular societal notions about the powerful, wide-eyed innocence of children and the ways we juxtapose the anxieties and disillusionment of adult life with childhood's capacity for imagination, faith, and wonder flow overwhelmingly from streams of romantic thought. not working on click. Okay. <clears throat> so before we delve into that, uh, we should probably also deal with perhaps the most common question about surprise by joy and romanticism, and that is the connection between joy and the sublime. Joy is Lewis's experience of transcendent longing, about which he says, in a sense, the central story of my life is about nothing else. Now the connection between joy and sublimity is kind of the proverbial dead horse of scholarship on Lewis and Romanticism, so I don't want to linger over long on it, but I will quickly draw out the comparison, particularly in case you haven't read Surprise by Joy. Lewis describes his initial childhood experience of joy thus. He sees a currant bush, which evokes a memory, and the memory draws him out of himself into a mysterious transcendent longing. He then returns to normal reality, aching to recapture the short-lived feeling. Lewis's assertion that the memory arose from centuries and that there are not words strong enough to describe the feeling, as well as his use and following re-emphasis of the word enormous, certainly indicate Kant and Burke's theories about the absolutely great and infiniteness of the sublime. More significantly, from Kant to Weissel, every critical description of the sublime seems to understand it as a basic threefold process into which Lewis's description fits, that of familiar experience, followed by a sort of defamiliarization that results into transcendence, and then refamiliarization with added significance and longing. Clearly, Lewis's experience, or at least his description of that experience, aligns with this common narrative. So let's agree that C.S. Lewis's joy can be clearly characterized as romantic experience, whether it be Zendruk, the sublime, or as I personally believe, a little bit of a mixture of the two. What I'd like to examine is the intricate role that romanticism plays in his autobiography, and thus in Lewis's self-construction, so his sense of identity and growth, who he thinks he is. Although it is a conversion story, Surprise by Joy details Lewis's movement through what I have defined as a romantic meta-narrative. Tonight we will spend some time explaining what that is, and then examining its role as the central structuring agent in Surprise by Joy. Canonical romantic poets like Blake, Wordsworth, Keats, Shelley, and Coleridge provide important source material for Lewis. For the purposes of our time tonight, I'm going to focus mainly on Blake and Wordsworth. So we'll start with William Blake. <clears throat> In 1789, William Blake published a collection of original poems and engravings entitled Songs of Innocence. The work presented a revolutionary new vision of childhood, one that rejected the traditional concept of original sin, suggesting instead that children are born naturally innocent, echoing a Christian prelapsarian state. In Blake's songs, innocence, or childhood, is a condition in which the individual enjoys unfractured relationship with nature and with God. The natural world of the songs of innocence is largely pastoral, it's peaceful and friendly, reflecting unity with the innocent child. Thus, Blake's schoolboy reports that, quote, the skylark sings with me, and the poem The Nurse's Song depicts a mingling between the sounds of children and those of the natural world. Quote, the voices of children are heard on the green, and laughing is heard on the hill. Hopefully this is clear also from the corresponding images. Uh, we have these figures of children in nature being almost caressed by it, sometimes practically melting into it. There's just kind of a unity of form and affect between them. Many of the Songs of Innocence also express a simple and solid faith, often depicted through a catechistic structure of question and answer. 
The poem On Another Sorrow follows a call and response in which the narrator asks questions and then answers them. First, it addresses human sympathy, asking, can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow too? The answer is no. Then the question shifts to God, asking whether God sees our pain without joining in. Again, the answer is no. Finally, the narrator expounds upon God's deep empathy for humanity through the example of Christ, who gives us joy and shares our sorrow. In other words, the Blakeian child experiences a firm, simple faith and a harmonious relationship with creation and creator. Unfortunately, innocence is also vulnerable. Figures like the shepherd and the nurse represent protection and adult nurturing within the song so that the child may remain in peace. All of this protection further suggests that innocence is not only vulnerable, but short-lived. In the poem Night, innocence is seen to be fleeting as the day gives way to night, and one must say farewell, green field and happy grove, hearing instead wolves and tigers howl for prey. Blake makes it clear that innocence will ultimately give way to a fall, that of experience. Five years after he published Songs of Innocence, Blake published Songs of Innocence and of Experience, with the subtitle, Showing the Two Contrary States of the Human Soul. This new volume introduced the Songs of Experience and placed the two poem collections side by side, thereby contrasting those two states. Unlike the childish Songs of Innocence, the more mature adult perspective of experience is pained and disillusioned, cognizant of death full of religious skepticism. Blake's poetry and engravings depict experience as disunity, chaos, even lack of meaning. The poem, The Clod and the Pebble, utilizes call and response to depict contradiction on both a natural and a spiritual level. In that poem, the clod makes an orthodox statement, love seeketh not itself to please. And the pebble replies by directly contradicting it, Love seeketh only self to please. In this way, nature itself is seen to be in discord, and the simple Christian maxims of innocence are carelessly shoved aside for wicked, experienced ones. Another classic example of contrast between innocence and experience is that of the companion poems The Lamb and the Tiger. While the innocent narrator of The Lamb asks and answers its own questions, the experienced narrator of The Tiger provides only questions difficult questions to which Blake offers no answers. In fact, you may notice that while the Lamb poem, it does pose questions, it doesn't actually use any question marks at the ends of those questions. And that's something that Blake does elsewhere when the answer is obvious or a foregone conclusion. The tiger, on the other hand, lacks the catechistic certainty of the Lamb. It abounds in question marks and emphatically ends by asking essentially the same question with which it began. The human state of experience, as Blake presents it to us, seems utterly miserable on pretty much any level, physical, spiritual, intellectual, you name it. Blake does, however, offer glimpses of hope. Both volumes of songs hint at the possibility of a higher innocence that lies beyond experience. The introduction to songs of experience expresses a longing for a fallen light renewed and exclaims, O earth, O earth, return. This longing anticipates higher innocence as a renewal of nature and the humankind through resurrection. Furthermore, the introduction to Songs of Innocence depicts the poet piping merry tunes for an angelic child, suggesting that the imaginative process of literary art, particularly that for or about the child, may be a path to higher innocence. For as UC Nothelmacher recalls, the creative process involved in literature about children requires quote, an adult reactivation of childhood selves. The child in the introductory poem enjoys the poet's song and asks him to write a book. The creation of this book entails a necessary corruption of innocence, as the poet must whittle a reed into a rural pen and stain water into ink in order to write his happy songs. But this experience is necessary as a means towards higher innocence, for the poems, we are told, will invoke joy to hear thereby recovering the unity of innocence whilst retaining the knowledge and wisdom of experience. In this manner, Blake hints to the reader about something beyond, a higher and better reality than innocence, a heavenly reality that can be glimpsed, if not fully attained, through human imagination. <laughs>
Okay, so far so good, but you may be wondering, what does this have to do with Surprise by Joy? And did Lewis even know about Blake's songs? Well, we know that Lewis interacted and corresponded with a woman named Kathleen Rain. Kathleen Rain was a Cambridge colleague of his and a Blake scholar, and she actually reports in one place that Lewis, quote, was more than a match for her in conversations about the poet. Lewis also mentions Blake's writings in several letters, in one calling the combined songs heavenly music, and elsewhere calling them lightning from a clear sky. So we know that Lewis read and enjoyed Blake on a deep intellectual level, and his references to the songs of innocence and of experience suggest a particular affinity with Blake's radical perspective on human life and growth. Before we look at Surprise by Joy, we may actually find another example particularly helpful. The romantic meta-narrative, that's innocence, experience, and higher innocence, with its emphasis on the child, is nowhere more apparent than in Lewis's stories for children. And the dedication to the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe provides a nice digestible example of Lewis's romantic meta-narrative at work. My dear Lucy, he writes, I wrote this story for you, but when I began it, I had not realized that girls grow quicker than books. As a result, you are already too old for fairy tales, and by the time it is printed and bound, you will be older still. It is no difficult task to correlate the dedication to fictionalized Lucy, Lucy Barfield, daughter of Owen Barfield, with the romantic meta narrative. The fairy tale child, the fairy tale reading child Lucy, represents innocence. The too old for fairy tales Lucy is in the stage of experience. And the hypothetical mature Lucy, who can start reading them again, represents higher innocence. It is also possible to trace in this dedication an echo of Lewis's own story. For the trajectory he anticipates for Lucy reflects his own progress through the romantic meta narrative, which he would later record in Surprise by Joy. Although he does at times use actually the exact same language as Blake, Lewis titles the stages of his own romantic progression childhood, boyhood, and renaissance. And of course, this personal renaissance is inaugurated by the return of joy, which he felt in childhood, lost in boyhood, and then sort of reclaimed after the renaissance of adolescence. In Surprised by Joy, we find plenty of evidence that Lewis internalized these romantic ideas. Lewis describes his childhood in terms highly resonant with Blake's version of innocence. The child Lewis is Blake's naive, is like his Blake's naive happy narrative, living in a period of humdrum prosaic happiness. He repeatedly refers to the time as one of general happiness, settled happiness, and emphasizes his naivete by explaining that, quote, like other children, I had no standard of comparison. The child Lewis of Surprise by Joy is humble and childlike and self-forgetful and is from time to time, quote, accused of offenses which I lack the resources to commit. This is, of course, also the state in which Lewis first experiences joy, right, his experience of transcendence and longing. But I actually don't consider those descriptions particularly Blakean because I don't think the Blakean child is particularly sublime. So we'll save that for a discussion of Wordsworth. The end of Lewis's innocence, arrives with the death of Flora Lewis. Along with the loss of his mother comes a complete rupture of settled happiness, the unity that Lewis perceives in his earlier life. Experience with all of its characteristic evils creeps into the Lewis household at this point in the narrative. The first image of experience that Lewis offers the reader is decidedly Blakean. There came a night when I was ill and crying, both with headache and toothache, and distressed because my mother did not come to me, recalls Lewis. Just as parental protection, the image of the mother bending over the cradle in infant joy or cradle song, is a hallmark of innocence, so parental neglect characterizes experience. Furthermore, the trope of the unanswered question or plea typifies Blake's description of experience, just as Lewis's mother fails to answer him in his distress. One protector figure having failed, Lewis turns to God himself and makes a fervent attempt at prayer. When Flora is known to be sick, he offers prayers for her recovery, but they go unanswered, and he says, nevertheless, she died. These unanswered prayers represent a failure to answer the sorts of questions about parental and divine empathy that Blake raised in On Another's Sorrow, 
The result is alienation, both from the once familiar landscapes of childhood and from parental nurture. In an echo of Blake's transition from the laughter of innocent daytime to the wolves and tigers howls of night, Lewis reports a sudden transformation in his own home, writing, quote, our whole existence changed into something alien and menacing as the house became full of strange smells and midnight noises and sinister whispered conversations. It divided us from our father as well as our mother. Lewis describes himself and Warren at this point in a particularly Blakean image as two frightened urchins huddled for warmth in a bleak world. And he closes the chapter of his innocence by explaining, with my mother's death, all settled happiness all that was tranquil and reliable disappeared from my life. No more of the old security. It was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like Atlantis. Not only is this final image significant for its demonstration of disunity and alienation and insecurity, but the reference to Atlantis also has a potentially Blakean origin. Kathleen Rain, remember that's Lewis's friend, attests that for Blake, the lost Atlantis is yet another version of the myth of the lost paradise. So whether Lewis absorbed this image from his own reading of Blake, from conversations with Rain, or from both, it does seem that he again intentionally evokes a Blakean symbol of the fall from innocence with this reference to Atlantis. Flora's death brings experience into Lewis's self-construction, but certainly it's not the fulfillment of experience. School also plays a distinct role in this for Lewis. At the beginning of his chapter, entitled Concentration Camp, I wonder how he felt about school. <laughs> Lewis again invokes what he believes to be another Blakean image, <coughs> writing, the putting on of school clothes was, I well knew, the assumption of a prison uniform. In a 1917 letter, Lewis mentioned the rules of our prison house, as Blake called them. Interestingly, Lewis misattributes this phrase to Blake, for in fact, it is a direct quote from W.D. Yeats's introduction to an edition of Blake's collected poetry. And strangely enough, it seems most likely that the phrase occurred to Yeats as an echo of Wordsworth's Shades of the Prison House from the Intimations Ode. That both Yeats and Lewis should naturally associate this phrase with Blake, though, only emphasizes how universally Blake is credited as the source of romantic innocence and experience. And indeed, Blake's schoolboy in the poem of that name does attest that school drives away all joy, comparing himself to a bird in a cage. So Lewis depicts his loss of innocence as an ongoing process, begun by his mother's death, which sent him to boarding school, and, which, and boarding school, he says, is the setting for his loss of faith, of virtue, and of simplicity, all characteristics of Blakean innocence. The growth of literary pride he also describes as a kind of fall, saying that his simple enjoyment of literature was an innocence that did not last. Ultimately, he describes his stage of experience as an alien territory in which the imagination slept, to sort of sum up that quote. With adolescence, however, Lewis invokes a Blakean higher innocence through the reintroduction of joy into his life. Joy's reappearance represents his personal renaissance. This reawakening paradoxically represents higher innocence, and yet only the longing for higher innocence, the anticipation of it. Just as Blake's songs merely hint at the possibility of present and future higher innocence. For Lewis, higher innocence seems to represent the now and not yet nature of Christ's kingdom, of heaven. He explains that joy is a longing, yet it was also fruition. I had tasted heaven then. True, it was desire, not possession. Only possession insofar as that kind of desire is itself desirable is the fullest possession we can know on earth. Blake actually presents a similar concept of the imagination. Um, he says in his vision of the last judgment, this world of imagination is the world of eternity. It is the divine bosom into which we shall all go after the death of the vegetated body. This world of imagination is infinite and eternal, whereas the world of generation or vegetation is finite and temporal. The use of imagination for Blake, therefore, is much like Lewis's joy. It is both an entrance into and a prophecy of heaven. Although Lewis definitely draws Blake's Neoplatonic concept further towards the realm of orthodoxy, the Blakean inspiration, I think, is difficult to ignore. 
For Lewis like Blake, the romantic imagination, with its capacity for transcendence, can provide glimpses of the future reality of heaven itself. Another characteristic of Lewis's higher innocence, which he inherits originally from Blake, is this idea that higher innocence is a, is a higher state, but it's still childlike, right? So it's his adult higher innocence is at unity with his childhood. Yet it was not Blake alone who influenced Lewis's self-understanding. William Wordsworth also plays a key role in the development and establishment of that narrative. In particular, I propose that, surpri that Lewis's Surprised by Joy um, is actually based on Wordsworth's prelude, both in content and structure. Begun in 1798 and only published after the poet's death in 1850, Wordsworth's prelude is an autobiography in blank verse, specifically focused on the poet's development from childhood until his poetic coming of age, aka the growth of a poet's mind. Now before I enter this section, it's worth mentioning that I've spent an extended amount of time at the Marion E. Wade Center in Wheaton, Illinois, and their collection there includes Lewis's personal library. So I've actually been able to um, <clears throat> draw some of my conclusions here based on things that Lewis wrote in the margins and underlined in his copies of Wordsworth's poetry and other relevant texts. So I won't take the time to explicitly point it out in every instance, but I am deliberately juxtaposing Surprised by Joy with passages that Lewis underlined or otherwise marked in his own copy of that book. Before suggesting Wordsworth's influence on Surprised by Joy, however, <clears throat> we must confront the fact that Lewis was at times openly condescending, even hostile to Wordsworth. He accused Wordsworth of worshipping nature in The Four Loves, and in Surprised by Joy, he is careful to emphasize the sense of loss in Wordsworth, twice referencing the line, whither is fled the visionary gleam, from Wordsworth's Intimations Ode. Yet there is a wide scholarly consensus to show that Lewis was deeply impacted by Wordsworth, and Lewis actually listed the prelude as one of the ten books that, quote, did most to shape my vocational attitude and my philosophy of life. Lewis read the prelude for the first time, we think, in 1919, and mentions reading it again in a 1939 letter. A marginal note in his copy of Wordsworth states that he read it in full again in 1923, and in June of 1924, he records in his diary, I brought Wordsworth out to the garden, and there in the delicious coolness, I read book one of the prelude. This poem is really beginning to replace Paradise Lost as my literary metropolis. I'm very sorry, Dr. Hampton. <laughs> in 1941, he divulges that he likes to occasionally refresh himself by a dip into the prelude. And in 1947, he is again rereading the prelude, which is, quote, always just a little better than one remembers from the last reading. Thus, in 1951, he appropriately recalls, quote, the prelude has accompanied me through all stages of my pilgrimage. By the way, if we have any Wordsworth aficionados in the room, uh, it appears shockingly that Lewis only owned and possibly only read the 1850 edition of that text, none of the earlier versions. And surprised by joy, when Lewis prepares to describe joy for the first time, he admits, the thing has been much better done by Wordsworth. I personally believe that to be not only a comment on Wordsworth's ability to depict the sublime in poetry, but the larger endeavor of romantic autobiography itself. Lewis is trying to do the same thing Wordsworth did. The problem with this theory, of course, is the question of form. If Lewis intended to write his own prelude, why didn't he write in blank verse? Well, the fact is he actually had already attempted to do so. <coughs> well, not blank verse, but in, in verse. Lewis's first attempt to write his spiritual autobiography occurred, occurred shortly after his conversion to theism in 1930, and it resulted in an unfinished prose piece in which he began to explain his views as an empirical theist. We know from Surprised by Joy that this conversion, while pivotal, was not necessarily significant for Lewis's imaginative life. Mm -hmm. His conversion to Christianity, however, reawakened his imagination and invested the experience of joy with new meaning. Christianity for Lewis meant a realization of the incarnation as true myth, which he documents in a 1931 letter to Arthur Greaves. And this realization apparently renewed his interest in telling the story of his conversion. Less than seven months later, he had begun a long poem, 
It's now known as I Will Write Down, detailing his spiritual autobiography. And if you're interested, the fragment that exists of that poem has been transcribed in full in uh, John King's 2001 book, C.S. Lewis Poet. I suspect Lewis was thinking about the prelude as he began this prototype of surprise by joy. For he writes to Owen Barfield in March of 1932, stating, I have written about a hundred lines of a long poem in my type of Alexandrian. It is going to make the prelude look silly. He then sends the opening of the poem, the portion that King has reproduced, to Barfield in May of that year. Lewis's first Christian attempt at spiritual autobiography is therefore modeled after the prelude, and I maintain that the autobiography he finally published in 1955 is still Lewis's prelude, despite its prose form. I expect he eventually recognized that he was even less equal to Wordsworth when he was writing in verse. I think we can probably all agree that Lewis is most effective in prose. Like the prelude, which is more concerned at times with the poet's perspective than with reality itself, Surprised by Joy is, by Lewis's own admission, suffocatingly subjective. In other words, it is concerned with his own subjective experience of things, rather than with the hard biographical facts. Many have argued that this subjectivity actually strays into utter falsehood or deliberate repression, painting an unrealistically rosy picture of Lewis's life. Perhaps most obvious is the complete erasure of his non-traditional, almost certainly sexual relationship with Janie Moore, who is never overtly mentioned. Lewis also refers to his earlier sexual indiscretions only vaguely, omitting the fixation with sadism that he describes in early letters to Grieg. While these omissions may have sprung from self-protection, they also protect the purity of Lewis's romantic narrative. Eugene Stelzig identifies the modern autobiography with its emphasis on the development of the individual's subjectivity as a romantic invention. Patricia Meyer Spax calls the practice of autobiography the conversion of life into story. So it is not altogether surprising that in this conversion process, Lewis should pick and choose the details and events in order to mold his life into the romantic narrative he has clearly chosen. Chronologically, these sexual indiscretions would occur later in the narrative, after Lewis's adolescent renaissance, and thus in the section that could be identified as either higher innocence or the quest for higher innocence. So, Lewis's application of the romantic meta-narrative to structure Surprised by Joy may help explain some of his omissions. Furthermore, Lewis may have found a precedent for this suffocating subjectivity in Wordsworth. In his copy of Dorothy Wordsworth's famous journal, Lewis marks passages pertaining to the collaboration between Dorothy and William and a number of linguistic curiosities, but also, and I think most intriguing, he marks passages that make reference to Annette Vallon, who is Wordsworth's French lover and the mother of Wordsworth's illegitimate daughter, Caroline, and he marks passages that seem to hint at latent sexuality between William and his sister Dorothy. Lewis is not the only reader to have puzzled over these passages, and he must have noted the absence of any mention of Vallon or any hint of abnormal sibling attachment in the prelude. He may therefore have considered his own omissions fitting for the type of writing in which he labored. Having established Lewis's conscious participation in the romantic practice of autobiography and his particular association of the prelude with this genre, we may draw the comparison even further. Not only does Lewis's narrative follow the romantic meta-narrative as originated in Blake, but Lewis seems to have deliberately mirrored his text with that of Wordsworth's prelude. A comparison between the 14 books of Wordsworth's prelude and the first 14 chapters of Surprised by Joy reveals some striking parallels in structure. The reflection is imperfect, yet compelling, I think. For the sake of time, I'm going to describe just a few of these. Book and Chapter 1 <coughs> both deal with childhood innocence. First and foremost in both accounts is the solitary, innocent child. For Wordsworth, of course, this means the child in nature, being fostered alike by beauty and by fear in the natural world, enjoying unconscious intercourse with beauty, older <coughs> creation, and gathering, as it seemed, through every hairbreadth in that field of light, new pleasure. So the Wordsworthian child enjoys a harmony with the natural world akin to Blake. But unlike Blake's innocence, the Wordsworthian child is highly sensitive to the sublime. 
This is the book of the boat stealing episode, where sublime nature overwhelms the child, giving it a dim and undetermined sense of unknown modes of being and huge and mighty forms that move slowly through the mind. In Surprise by Joy, the child Lewis is similarly isolated and sensitive to the sublime. But nature has been exchanged for Lewis's own preferred medium, that of books. This description, which I'm not going to read, but you can skim through it, <laughs> presents the Lewis home as a sublime, almost gothic interior with its long corridors, empty rooms, foreboding silences, solitude, and distant noises. And it offers an indoor equivalent to Wordsworth's beautiful yet terrifying nature. The endless piles of books form mountains and hills, creating a sublime literary landscape in which the romantic child may wander unhindered. The comparison between books and blades of grass again reminds us that Lewis's experience with books is the same as Wordsworth's with nature. Just as we find the young Wordsworth making one long bathing of a summer's day, we therefore see Lewis enjoying endless rainy afternoons of reading. The combination of this description coupled with the three occurrences of joy that Lewis recounts. One involves a toy garden, the other two involve the reading of Beatrix Potter and Longfellow. These suggest that Lewis's joy, which sounds undeniably Wordsworthian in description, is nevertheless distinct. While, Lu while Wordsworth's sublime is generally rooted in nature, particularly in the early books of the prelude, Lewis's experience are what David Sandner calls the fantastic sublime which is not anchored in the world of sense experience, but unmoored from reality. Lewis seems to believe that this helps one to focus outwardly rather than inwardly, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Another significant resonance between Wordsworth and Lewis's descriptions of innocence in book and chapter one is their emphasis on the power and centrality of memory. Margaret Carter notes that, quote, Lewis, like Wordsworth, finds in the remembered and transformed past a special stimulus to imagination. In book one, Wordsworth celebrates the memory's ability to recall childhood, but also to transmute it into sublime vision. Lewis similarly admits the capacity of memory both to conjure up and to transform the past when he explains that his first exposure to joy was a memory of a memory and that his original interaction with the toy garden was insignificant, while memory transformed it and made it significant. The fall into experience that is described by both men over the course of several chapters I will now gloss over, only mentioning that this is a stage in which Wordsworth says, the imagination slept. And Lewis, if you'll recall that earlier description of boyhood, borrows Wordsworth's exact words, saying that in boyhood, the imagination has slept. Book and chapter five present another interesting juxtaposition as each author addresses the other's territory. In book five, entitled simply Book, Wordsworth acknowledges, albeit hesitantly, even begrudgingly, that books can have a similar power to that of nature. The sublime is for Wordsworth secondary to that of nature, for while nature is a deathless spirit, books are the shrines so frail in which she can lodge. He does, however, seem to give some privilege to fantasy's ability to give way to strengthening love for things that we have seen. Lewis reverses this process, detailing his personal renaissance in which joy returns and is now available not only through books, but through nature as well. I believe Lewis is very deliberate in his language here for two reasons. Initially, I think he wishes to clearly demonstrate that he is reversing Wordsworth's model. Instead of books aspiring to nature, nature is a mere reminder of books. Second, he begins to establish here the difference that he will draw between himself and Wordsworth. He does not attempt to argue for books as the original source of joy, but instead attests that books and nature are both merely reminders of what he will later identify as God and heaven. Wordsworth, on the other hand, seemingly recommends nature as the substantive sublime source as though nature were a physical manifestation of God himself, or at least so I believe it seems to Lewis. This distinction will become more important as Lewis continues to develop his own prelude. Book and chapters 6 through 11, I'm going to just pass right over, though they do contain some parallels. Um, but book and chapters 12 and 13 are quite interesting. Um, 
Book 12 of the Prelude describes the poet's retreat back to nature, his restored faith in the whole human race as one brotherhood, and his growth into higher innocence, which involves enshrining the spirit of the past for future restoration, right? So it's a looking back in order to actually move forward into this higher innocence. Book 13 climaxes with the influential friendship of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who teaches Wordsworth about the polar unity of imagination and reality, the ennobling interchange of action from within, without, I'm sorry, and from within, thereby encouraging Wordsworth into full fruition as a poet. Lewis's chapter 12, Guns in Good Company, describes not so much Lewis's war experience as his relational experience with other men and his coming to know and pity and reverence the ordinary man. Chapter 13 depicts his growing understanding of non-material reality, reaching a crescendo with the influential friendship of Owen Barfield, who teaches him that, quote, our logic was participation in a cosmic logos, and pushes him into belief in the absolute. Barfield, who was a respected Coleridge scholar, certainly represents Coleridge's influence in Lewis's personal prelude. While, while Coleridge helps Wordsworth mature as a poet, which is the ultimate end of the prelude, Barfield assists Lewis closer to the realization of God, which is the goal of Surprised by Joy. Finally, book and chapter 14 serve as the final recognitions towards which all the past narrative development has tended. Wordsworth describes the sublime ascent of Snowden as an image of the soul's ascent through poetry saying, all affections by communion raised from earth to heaven, from human to divine. Lewis's chapter, Checkmate, similarly climaxes with his final recognition that God was God and the final object of joy. We do have one problem, though. Surprised by Joy consists of 15 chapters to the prelude's 14 books. That initially, when I was thinking through all this, really bothered me. But I think we can make sense of it. It is clear that Lewis doubted Wordsworth's Christianity and may have even conceived of himself, to use um, Prothero and Williams's word, as completing Wordsworth's vision. In this light, it comes as no surprise that Lewis would choose to add an additional chapter onto his own prelude, the chapter which details his conversion from theism, pure and simple, to Christianity. He makes this particularly clear by reminding the reader on the last page, I cannot indeed complain like Wordsworth, that the visionary gleam has passed away. I know now that joy, considered as a state of my own mind, had never had the kind of importance I once gave it. It was only valuable as a pointer to something other and outer. While the other was in doubt, the pointer naturally looms large in my thought. When we are lost in the woods, the sight of a signpost is a great matter. He who first sees it cries, look. The whole party gathers round and stares. But when we have found the road and are passing signposts every few miles, we shall not stop and stare. The final metaphor of joy as signpost reiterates both Lewis's debt to the Romantic metanarrative as well as his wish to revise the Romantic. Lewis's metanarrative emphasizes higher innocence as forward movement, not regression. The use of the title, The Beginning, for this chapter emphasizes progress as opposed to a mistaken nostalgia for childhood. Joy looks simultaneously backwards and forward, being a desire for something longer ago or further away or still about to be. It is both a present taste of heaven as well as an anticipation of heaven, even when it arises out of memory. Clearly, Lewis found Wordsworth's sublime to be too fixated on the vanished past. He seems to have been unconvinced by Wordsworth's commitment to grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. Instead, finding Wordsworth's vision in need of revision. Indeed, by mirroring the structure of the prelude and his own autobiography, and then adding a final chapter, Lewis effectively offers Surprise by Joy as a sort of new, improved prelude. Though I am not personally convinced that it makes the prelude look silly, it does provide a thoughtful critique of the romantic meta-narrative at large. The very thing that makes this narrative compelling and helpful is also the reason it cannot sustain a full Christian vision. The romantic meta narrative is, in some manner, an individualization of the biblical meta narrative of creation, fall, and redemption. Innocence, experience, and higher innocence may speak helpfully to individual experiences of beauty, truth, even divinity, 
But the suffocating subjectivity, to use Lewis's words, of that narrative cannot fully capture the cosmic and corporate reality of the body of Christ or the absolute truth of divine being and activity, particularly as manifest in the incarnate word. Lewis admits that his final resistance to Christianity was that, quote, one had less, one had less chance to call one's soul one's own because acceptance of the incarnation of Christ brought God nearer or near in a new way. Lewis's closing image is not only symbolic of his insistence on forward movement, but the impossibility of journeying alone, thus the sudden shift in his language from I to we. While there is value in the lone wanderer crying, look, it is neither his genius nor his sublime solitude that ultimately compels us. His call is an appeal for relationship, an invitation to walk alongside. So Lewis, a Christian, finds the romantic meta-narrative helpful insofar as it provides an apt framework for his own subjective experience of the world. But this individual subjective narrative is only useful insofar as it submits to a higher authority, the objective, universal meta-narrative of God's cosmic work. One might argue that the romantics take self-realization as their ultimate goal, and thus higher instance becomes very inwardly focused. Lewis, on the other hand, takes divine realization as his goal. Higher innocence for Lewis is outwardly focused. It involves the subjective observer in grasping towards objective reality. It propels one forward along the road whose destination is the very face of God.